beat depression. The baptism will help you beat depression. It'll help you beat anxiety. It'll help you beat fear. This gift from the Father. This gift that is a baptism of the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions will help you beat it. Any of those and all three and so much more. It not only fills us with power to be a witness, um, it meets our need for encouragement, strength, and peace. It meets our need for encouragement in times of fear, strength when we are weak and overcome with anxiety. It, it meets our need for these things. This is what the baptism does. And I hope I can communicate that well. Uh, comfort us. It comforts us in, when we're... Uh, in a place, in a dark place in our life. It'll comfort us. We can have a relationship with, with the Lord through the baptism that transforms all those areas of our life. It'll, it'll transform the way you think. It'll transform your emotions. It'll, it'll transform uh, your will, the things you give yourself to, the desires of your heart. It transforms all that. That's why it's so important for us to receive what God has us to receive, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's the nourishment of our soul. It's a thing that comforts, encourages, and strengthens. Now, doctors, psychologists, pharmacists may not agree with that statement. But they are not the ones who created us. Right? They're not the ones who created us. Now, with that said, I truly believe psychologists, doctors, and even medications can help people as well. There are times and seasons where... Uh, Counseling, uh, medications can help help a person, help a person through some bad places, some dark places. I have uh, good pastor friends who have gone through, to uh, uh, gone to psychologists. Uh, they they've been helped through medications, and these are ministers of God, men of God. And so there's times and seasons that, you know, that's a good thing. That's a helpful thing. You know, we we don't hesitate to medicate when there's something going on with our heart. You know, if we've got a high blood pressure, we have, don't hesitate to take a medication or our liver or kidneys or whatever. Why is the brain any different when it's going through struggles and going through problems and going through things that medications can help uh, heal and, and set free? Well, why not counseling when, when counseling is needed? I'm a firm believer in those things. I do counseling. So I'm not anti-doctor, psychologist, or medications. I'm just saying the Holy Spirit can bring health to the soul. The baptism of the Holy Spirit can bring health, comfort, and strength to the soul. The soul of man. Um, and we can beat, and when that happens, we can beat depression, we can beat anxiety, and we can beat fear. And it's a whole lot cheaper, by the way. <laughs> um, Okay, real quickly, let me give you three things to beat depression, anxiety, and fear. Real, real, real quickly, uh, there's no charge for this. This is pastoral counseling. <laughs> I do charge for counseling, by the way. I tell people, listen, you can go, uh, you can go to First Baptist down here and, and, and get, they have a whole ministry of counselors, and, and, you, and they charge anywhere from $60 an hour to, to $150 an hour depending upon who you get based upon their education and background. And so I, I tell people, if I counsel them, I charge you. You know what I charge you? They look at me, well, Pastor, what do you charge? I say, you got to do what I tell you to do. <laughs> it's real simple. What good is this counseling if you don't do what I tell you to do? We're going to waste a whole hour here, two hours here, because you just didn't do what I told you to do. So, here, <laughs> so that's my charge. I, that's what I charge for marital, marital counseling. And how many of y'all know that's true? <laughs> Some of y'all been through it. You already know that's true. <laughs> and that's what I charge for, for personal counseling, encouragement. Uh, when I'm in a counseling session, I charge. You've got to do, you've got to follow the instructions. You've got to take the medication. It's just a whole lot cheaper. Or is it? That's a good question. Okay, number one. Number one, I want you, if you're to beat depression, anxiety, and fear... Start journaling. Start a prayer journal. 
Start a prayer journal, number one. Start journaling what you're feeling, what's, what's causing your anxiety, what you're fearful of, what you're going through. Just start writing it down. Write down what you're feeling and what you're going through. Journaling will allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. It'll allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. You're going to slow down long enough that the Holy Spirit can actually speak to you. He's not chasing you around a room and all your anxiety and all your fears. He's got you held up. You bumped into him. Now he's holding on to you. <laughs> That's just start, he's going to start speaking to you. He'll speak to you through the whisper and the scripture. Through the whisper and the scripture. Journaling will allow, you, uh, allow the Holy Spirit to remind you of what he's done in your past. The miracles he's worked in your own past. The memorial stones that you set up because God did something great at that point. Journaling will allow him to remind you of that. So the next time you're in a dark place, you can look at it and that light will take you out of that dark place. The light of the past will take you out. So journaling allows the Holy Spirit for the whisper in the scripture to remind you of those things and what he's done. Write it down and date it. Write down your struggles and your problems and your feelings and your worries and write those things down and put a date on it. You know, so much of the book of Psalms is David, David's prayer journal, <laughs> if you think about it. Write down what he's afraid of, write down what he's going through, write down his struggles, what has him angry, what has him frustrated. It's just David's prayer journal, so much of it. Sometimes he'll sing about it, but it's just his prayer journal. The book of Lamentations is Jeremiah lamenting over the condition of Israel. He just, look at this God and look at this God and look at, you know, he's lamenting. Write down your Lamentations. What, write down those things you feel like lamenting over. What you're doing when you do this is you're giving a Holy Spirit opportunity to comfort you. So many times we miss that opportunity for the Holy Spirit to comfort us. We're so uncomfortable we can't stand still and we just keep moving until he can grab us and comfort us. So that's what this does. It gives that opportunity for the Lord to comfort you, for the Lord to whisper, to give you, remind you of scriptures. 2 Corinthians 1, 4 says, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others when they are in trouble we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. There's a purpose in the comfort he gives you. John 14, 26 says, But the helper, the comforter, and, and King James says, when the, But when the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance the things I said to you. He'll bring to remembrance when we slow down long enough to journal and spend time with the Lord like that. So journaling helps the, uh, the comforter give us the opportunity to be comforted. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. In the arena of the soul. In the arena of the soul. Number two, make a list of everything you're thankful for. Make a list of everything you're thankful for. A thankful list. Call it a thankful list. Everything you have, you're grateful to God for. You have gratitude toward God for. That's what gratitude is. It's that... that that expressing that thankfulness to someone for what they've done. Gratitude. In Jonah chapter 4 verse 6, it said the Lord prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah. Remember, Jonah was, was upset, you know. He just did the whole whale thing. Nineveh wasn't destroyed. He's all upset. He felt like God let him down. You ever feel like God let you down? No one ever feel like God let you down? Most of everyone. <laughs> and he's just miserable, and God causes a plant to come up over his head. And here's what he says. So it, it, made it, it made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. He was miserable, and God provided a plant. Hmm. Grateful for the plant to comfort him in his misery. 
That word grateful in the Hebrew can be translated as extremely happy, ecstatic, very glad. In other words, he was, he was, he was blessed by this, this plant. He was ecstatic about it. So make a list of those things in spite of your misery that you are very grateful for, you're very glad about, you're even ecstatic about them. It's a thankful list. Life can be miserable at times. But that doesn't mean we don't and can't be thankful, does it? Just because life is dealing with some bad things, we can still be thankful to God. From the Mayo Clinic Health System, studies have shown that expressing, expressing gratitude is associated with a host of mental and physical benefits. Feeling thankful can improve sleep, mood, and immunity. Immunity. Your immune system is better. <clears throat> studies have shown gratitude can decrease depression, anxiety, chronic pain, and risk of disease. Now, this is the Mayo Clinic. They go on to say gratitude should be practiced daily. They report that behavior changes biology. Positive gestures, benefits of thankfulness, for example. You are releasing oxytoxins, a hormone that helps connect people with each other, helps connect people. The things around them. Some call it the love hormone. Oxytoxin is called the love hormone. We all need the love hormone, don't we? <laughs> so make a thankful list. You're going to actually make a thankful list. This is how it's going to help you beat uh, fear, uh, depression, fear, and anxiety. Okay? Um, you can put on list things like the ability to see, to hear, to speak. There's a lot of people in the world that don't have that ability. If you can't think of anything, ask the Holy Spirit to show you things to be grateful for. Write down the ability to think, to reason, to process your thoughts. Because a lot of people don't have that ability, especially as they get older. Write down the names of your children, your family members, those that, are, that you're grateful for. Maybe not all. But those that you are, write down their names on your list. <laughs> those that you're grateful to God for, maybe all of them. Make a list of things like air conditioning. <laughs> a running vehicle. Running water. A bathroom in your house. You know, many people throughout the world don't have that. Think, be thankful that you're born in the USA, the most prosperous nation in the world. You could write down your church you're grateful for, the people in your church that you're grateful for, people that are around you that encourage you and strengthen you. Write down people you're thankful for, friends you're thankful for, church members you're thankful for. Pastor Nelson should be at the top of that list. <laughs> write down your salvation. God's grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. Make a list of those things that you're grateful for and allow the Holy Spirit to add to it. Now, here's the hard part. Here's the charge. Here's my charge. Meditate on that list every day until depression leaves you. Add to that list every day until depression leaves you. That's more than just the homework. That's, that's your pathway out of it, out of depression, out of fear. Don't stop until the depression stops. <clears throat> so every day, now you're journaling every day. Every day you're, you're listening for the whisper and the scripture. The Holy Spirit has you uh, making a list of things you're thankful to God for. And then number three, here's the last one. Here's, here's the easiest one of all. Pray in your prayer language. Pray in the Holy Spirit prayer language. Pray in that language from heaven. Pray in that language. 
Pray in the spirit, as they call it. Pray in your prayer language. It's why we don't ghost the ghost. Because with that prayer language, with the Holy Spirit baptism, can't, comes edification, comes a building up, the edification of our soul. That word, Scripture says this, 1 Corinthians 14, 4, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthening, is, is strengthened personally. But one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. That word strengthen and is translated in other translations to, to build up, to strengthen, to edify. Next time you find yourself depressed, the next time you find yourself fearful, the next time you find yourself anxious, take a moment. Give the Holy Spirit a moment and pray in your prayer language. Allow the Holy Spirit that moment to build you up, to strengthen you, to encourage you. When people, I counsel people that are going through things like this, I'll tell them this. I'll say, I want you to go home and I want you to pray in the Spirit for 15 minutes, nonstop. They'll come to me, Pastor, I'm depressed. Pastor, I'm overwhelmed. This thing is gripping me. This fear is gripping me. I don't know what's going on. I'm anxious all the time. I can't sleep. I'm not eating right. I don't feel good. I say, I want you to pray in the Spirit for 15 minutes, nonstop. And most people will get through about five. I'll ask them, did you pray for 15? Well, about five. You know what I charge, don't you? <laughs> so, I always remind them what I charge. Uh, you can go right down the street, it's $150 an hour. Or you can just do what I'm telling you to do. It's not hard. The results are amazing, by the way. The results are amazing. Why? Because God created us, He knows how we tick, He knows when the beat gets off. I have a pastor friend of mine who uh, several years ago, he went through such a dark season. It was a whole season of his life, totally dark season of depression. And this thing was absolutely demonic, overpowering him. Uh, he said he had to pray in the spirit one hour every day until that thing, that oppression finally left him. One hour every day, but he got free. This is the pastor. Just do these things and watch how quickly you beat depression, anxiety, and fear. And, and you can add to the list, amen? You can add to things like spiritual warfare because sometimes it is demonic, but sometimes it's not. It's just life beating you up. It's just the, that sense of feeling that God's let you down and life has let you down and people have let you down and you're just overwhelmed. So it's not always demonic, but sometimes it is. So you can add to... Uh, your strategy for what the Lord gives you to beat these things, you can add to that strategy spiritual warfare. You can add to that strategy worship, spending time in communing with the Lord. You can add to that strategy. In fact, I, I highly suggest you add to that strategy reading your Bible every day. Meditating on God's Word. Begin with these three things. You write these things down, date them, listen for the whisper, you start journaling, you make that thankful list, and you pray in the Spirit. We get down at times, but we don't have to stay down. But we might have to do something to get out of that hole. Scripture says in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Let me ask you something. Where does power come from in a Christian's life? Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power comes from the Holy Spirit. Where does love come from in a Christian's life? Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Gentleness, self-control, verse 23, against there is no such law. You know, it's when 
Um, it's our love deficit that causes so much anxiety in our life and so much fear in our life. Did y'all know that? It's, our, it's because of our love deficit. Uh, and not understanding God's love for us can create fear. And us not having love for others can, can create anxiety. Those two love deficits <laughs> cause so much fear and anxiety. That's why we need that love hormone. Because <laughs> you know? the people. But these things, when, when those love deficits are there, <clears throat> we can experience that. But where does love come from? It's a fruit of the Spirit. When love is there, there's no deficit. Power, love, and a sound mind. Mm. Where does a sound mind come from in a Christian's life? Who gives us a sound mind? Interesting, that word sound mind in that particular passage is translated self-control. And the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So the fruit of the Spirit is sound mind. So that is, that is your assignment. I've got about, I'm going to have to hurry. Okay, real quickly, and I mean real quickly, I want to go over some things because this is the last part of my uh, series on uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's talk about the tongue thing. That tongue thing. <laughs> I mean, you hear, you hear your response. I mean, you, even when you think about that tongue thing, you know. Like. Acts 2 1, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a tongue thing. <laughs> Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. Wouldn't you love to have been there, by the way? I mean, if you had to be somewhere at a certain time, I'd have loved to have been there. <clears throat> appeared and settled in each one of them. And every one present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. Now, all those who observed that day probably thought that's weird. In fact, they actually thought they were drunk. They were confused. What, what's going on? So they probably thought it was weird. And at, at the very least, they had questions about what was taking place, right? I mean, Peter had to say, these guys are not drunk like you're thinking they are because there, there was an observation that day of what was taking place. So at the very least, there was questions, so when you talk about that tongue thing, questions come to mind. Am I right? Questions come to mind. For example, what is it? I thought of seven questions. What is it? Uh, number one, what is it? Number two, what is the purpose of it? What's the purpose of that tongue thing? What is that tongue thing to begin with? What is the purpose of it? Number three, third, is it for today or just the early church? In other words, has it passed away like so many teach? That tongue, tongue thing was back then, man. There's nothing in this box for today. This represents our gift from the Father, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of our soul, the second encounter with God. We talked about all that last week. You can watch that message online. Third, is it for today or just for the early church? Fourth, do, we, do I have to speak in tongues? Great question. Fifth, can I be filled with the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues? Number six, do only some people have the ability to speak in tongues or is it for everyone who is baptized in the Spirit? That's an honest question. Do only some people have that ability? And number seven, and this is a good question that should be asked, <clears throat> should I think it's weird <laughs> to speak in tongues? Pastor, you know, all my friends think it's weird. Should I think it's weird to speak in tongues? I'll answer that one right now. <laughs> I'll answer that question first, that number seven first. 
since I don't have much time. And by the way, I'm going to give you the short answers for time's sakes. Uh, I'm going to recommend a couple great books. Uh, Robert Morris's The God I Never Knew. If you had not got this book and you have questions about the Holy Spirit, Robert does a great job as explaining the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then the books that uh, we handed out last week or loaned out last week, Pentecost. And so I have a couple of these up here if you want to borrow them. I can't give this one out. It's the only one I have, and I got it all marked up. But you can get that book. Um, should I think it's weird? The early church did not think it was weird. It was part of their culture as now as spirit-filled Christians. Right? They didn't think it was weird. The Apostle Paul did not think it was weird. He said in, in 1 Corinthians 14, 8, he said this. And imagine Paul standing up and telling everyone, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you or more than any of you. <sighs> I don't know what he was saying. Why he said that? I speak in tongues more than any of you. Well, he was confronting an issue in the church when he said that. 1 Corinthians 14, 5. I wish you all... I wish you could all speak in tongues. But even more, I wish you, would all, uh, you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. Now listen, prophetic tongue, tongue speech in a service needs to be interpreted for the benefit and the edification of the whole church, Right? Now, Paul goes on to say, they speak to yourself, unless it's, if it's a prophetic word, if it's interpreted, then that edifies the church. That's what he's saying. That's not, what's, that's not weird, is it? The church being edified? The, the Lord obviously doesn't think it's weird, or he would not have given you the Holy Spirit, which now enables you to speak in a language of heaven. The first question was, what is it? What is speaking in tongues? How do you explain to someone what speaking in tongues is? Anyone ever ask, anyone ever ask you, well, what is that speaking in tongues? What is that all about? Anybody? Okay. <clears throat> what is it? If we were all a bunch of scientists dressed in white coats and we're, we're in this big facility and we're going to research the answer to that question, what is this? You know, what, what is this tongue thing? Um, we would answer the, those questions through the data, through the data, the historical data, the scriptural data, the data, the data from people's experience. We would form an opinion as scientists based upon the data, right? So what's the data? Historically, on the day of Pentecost, they spoke in understood languages, right? Acts 2, 6 says, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. The Holy Spirit falls. Tongues are manifesting over people and they they hear them speaking in their own language so based on the historical data speaking in tongues is a language everybody agree this is this is old school for some of y'all i realize that but some of you never heard this before it's a language paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass and clinging cymbal. Evidently, angels have their own language. I'll submit to you, devils, fallen angels have their own language. So at the conclusion is, does, does God speak in the language of angels? Yes. Does he, know, does he only speak English? <laughs> does he only speak Hebrew? Does he only speak Spanish? God created man to understand languages, and God understands the languages. So does the Holy Spirit, who is God. Let me just put a word like that. God, the Holy Spirit, understands languages. <clears throat> there are two expressions of tongues identified in the New Testament. First is in the form of known languages, what we just read. Second, in the form of a prayer language or a praise language. A prayer language or a praise language. A, nonetheless, a language. 
1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. In other words, I don't understand what I'm praying. I'm praying in a tongue. Your spirit has a prayer language. You are a speaking spirit. My spirit talks to God. Your spirit can talk to God. It can pray. You hear someone prophesying in tongues, you praying in tongues and speaking in tongues, and you ask yourself, what is that? The answer is language. It's a language. A prayer language, a spirit language, a language of men, and a language of angels. Question number two, what is the purpose of tongues? <clears throat> what is the purpose of any language? What's the purpose of tongues? What's the purpose of that tongue thing? What's the purpose of any language? Help me. Communication. 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 Someone asks you, what is the purpose of speaking in tongues, brother? Your answer is communication. They're trying to rub your nose in the tongue thing. Your answer is, it's communication. It's talking to God. You ever talk to God? Do you ever pray in the understanding? That's talking to God. Acts 10, 44 says this, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on those who had heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as... Uh, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God or praise God, your translation may say. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? They hadn't even water baptized and they got filled with the Holy Spirit. And they knew they were filled with the Holy Spirit because they started speaking in tongues. They heard them praising God. The purpose of a prayer language is to magnify and to praise God, to communicate with God. Communicate in prayer, communicate in worship. That's the purpose. So it's communication. I'll submit to you, God is after communication, church family. God is after you talking to him. And sometimes we don't know what to pray. Sometimes we ever get in a place, I don't have a clue how to pray, but we can pray in the spirit, and that's talking to God, and God understands it, and he knows what we need, and he knows how to build us up through it. With tongues, we are not limited in our communication with God. Without tongues, we are. Without, and I'll submit to you, the churches that uh, who ghost the ghost are limited in their communications with God. And Christians who ghost the ghost are limited in their communications with God. Limited in the way to communicate at times when they don't know how to communicate, limited in the way they communicate when they need to communicate. So when we don't know how to pray, we pray in the Spirit. And we do warfare in the Spirit if we need to. And we sing in the Spirit. When I'm taking authority over the demonic realm, I'll find myself often praying in what I hope hopefully is a language of the devils that they understand clearly I don't know what I'm praying I just know that there's warfare taking place and I need to take authority over this and I don't have any problem speaking in tongues but that's just me <clears throat> um, we got to hurry the purpose of tongues is communication. Question number three, is it for today? <clears throat> My answer would be, are any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit for today? Any of them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Then it goes on down to verse 8. For one is given a word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another a word of knowledge through the, through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one in the same Spirit works all these things. 
or any of the gifts for today, or any of the gifts that come with the gift of the Holy Spirit for today. If they're not for today, then why do we pray for people to be healed? Do people need wisdom, words of knowledge from the Holy Spirit? Or any of the gifts for today? Most people don't seem to have a problem with these other gifts, just that tongue thing. Why is that? It's because they think it's weird. It's just as important as all the other gifts. It's just a lot of people just hope that gift is not in this box. <laughs> uh, number four, do I have to speak in tongues? That question comes as a result of fear and shame. Just like people who think it's weird, they, they only think it's weird because they don't understand it. Once they fully understand it, it's not that weird. Once they see it in the light of what God intended, it's not that weird. But when people say, do I have to speak in tongues, it, it comes with then uh, this sense of either fear or shame. I don't know if people think I'm weird. People already think you're weird. Do you even know you? <laughs> we all have a measure of weirdness. Except for, you know, Elder Mike over here. Probably don't think he's weird. <laughs> Lori might think he's weird. <clears throat> the question comes as a result of fear and shame. In that person's mind, they see the gift as a snake, a scorpion, or a stone. Talked about that last week. As something demonic, something to fear, or something that has no value. And the Father said, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, would I give you a snake? Would I give you a stone? Would I give you a scorpion? No, I'd give you bread, fish. That's what he gives us, what we need to nourish us. If we see the baptism in the light of what God intended, our question would be, Lord, when do I get to speak in tongues? Not do I have to, but when do I get to? If we really see it and, and understand it, God's now given me this ability to communicate in a way I've not been able to communicate before. The power of the Holy Spirit, the language of men and angels, I'm right up there with Paul. I'll speak in tongues more than you all. We'd say, when do I get it? And I'll answer that question is I don't know because some people, it's different for some people. Some people, right when they get baptized in the Spirit, they'll begin to speak in their prayer language. They'll have a heavenly language and they find that edification begins to take place right then. Others, it, it may be later on. You might have a different experience. Our white-coated scientists would say, well, we're not sure based on the data, the data, some people receive it right then and some people later on. The examples in the Bible, it was right then. My personal example, it was later on. I got saved. I got uh, saved about a year, maybe a little longer. And this Baptist spirit-filled pastor was preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and he said, do you want to be filled with the Spirit? And I raised my hand. Oh, yeah, give me all you got, God. I'm ready. <laughs> I had all the world. Now I wanted all of God. And so I wanted, I wanted all I got. And nothing happened. And I remember it was like a week later. We lived in Palmer, Texas. I'm sitting in my four-wheel drive pickup truck about to go to work in Plano. Got about eight miles to the gallon. <laughs> it's cold. I'm starting up my truck, and I'm just praying, beginning my day in prayer, just praying. And all of a sudden, I started speaking in a language I did not understand or know. My first question was, 
That's weird. What is that? <laughs> so for me personally, my experience is that that prayer language came along later on. How many of you, you got, got a prayer language later on after you, okay, okay. How many got a prayer language right when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit? Okay, yeah. I didn't ghost the ghost, by the way. It just took a while for, for I, get, I don't know. I just was praying my day. Lord, bless this day. Watch over Karen, da, 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 da. And boom. <laughs> I got to hurry. Um, you know what speaking in tongues was for me personally? Uh, and I need, it's my testimony. It was confirmation of the guarantee. For me personally, speaking in tongues was confirmation of, of God's presence in me and proof of the guarantee. You know, the scripture says this in Ephesians 1.13, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you also have believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. When I got saved, I really believed, I had faith to believe that the Holy Spirit was dwelling in me, and he was. But sitting in the pickup that morning, I had proof of that guarantee. I had confirmation of the guarantee. It was no longer just a faith thing for me. This is my testimony. It was no longer just a faith thing to me. I had proof of the guarantee. I had confirmation of his presence is dwelling in me. What does that do for you, Pastor? It means no devil in hell is going to talk me out of my salvation. It means no false teacher can convince me otherwise. It means I don't fear signs of the times or the end of the world. I don't worry about aliens or who's going to be the next president of the United States because I have the proof of the guarantee. His presence lives in me, and I know it, and it's not just a faith thing. So just my testimony. Question number five, can I be filled without speaking in tongues? Can I be filled without that tongue thing? I just would ask you, can you be filled without being full? I guess you have to answer that question yourself. Question number six. Do only some have the ability to speak in tongues or do all? My answer is yes and no. Yes, all have the ability to speak in their prayer language because your spirit has a language. No, not, all, not everyone has that gift of tongues, of communication that operates in the church uh, through the prophetic tongue being translated into a, or being spoken into the language of a man or man so you with me so yes and no yes you we all can have a prayer language no we don't all have the gift of speaking in tongues in the form of communications remember there's um, that was question number six <clears throat> remember there's uh, four functions of tongues the communication, edification, confirmation, and it's a sign to unbelievers. Okay? Worship team, if you'd come up here. I didn't really do that bad. I just basically preached two messages in the time I had allowed. Uh, I just felt like that you needed to know how to come out of this depression and fear. And I feel like you need to know that tongues is not a weird thing. It's an opportunity to receive the fullness of the gift right here. You know, a lot of people want this gift, but they don't want everything in it. Let's stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. Now, if you're new to Harvest Hill, we sing one last song, and we, uh, we give opportunity for people to come and receive prayer. That's just church. That's what we do. And then our worship leader will dismiss us. Scott, if you'll dismiss us in just a moment after the song. But I'm going to have my prayer team come up here. And I will pray for you for whatever need you might have. You might come today with something totally 
unrelated to what we've been talking about. But they're up here to pray for you, and prayer is powerful, by the way. Very proud, powerful. So we answered those seven questions, but the most important question we should be asking ourselves is, am I filled with the Holy Spirit? That should be a question every one of us have on our heart. Am I filled with the Holy Spirit? Young or old, am I filled with the Holy Spirit? Am I, have I been ghosting the ghost, <laughs> intentionally or unintentionally? Do I have everything that God wants me to have so I can experience the Christian life he wants to give me? These are the questions. Those other questions are, are good to know the answer to. But these are the questions. The reason these questions are important is because we receive the baptism in order to open the gift, we have to want everything that's in it. The reason these questions are, are important is because we have to want to receive. We have to want to tear this thing open and everything that's in this package, we open it up, we look in there and we say, Oh, yes, that's just for me. We're going to pick and choose. The reason these questions are important, am I filled? Have I been ghosting? Amen, young people? Stay with me. Am I filled? Have I been ghosting the ghost? These are the important questions. And if someone says to me, you know, that tongue thing, that's weird. In love, I'll say to them, brother, sister, as born-again believers, you and I both have the Spirit of God living in us. We both have the Holy Spirit living in us because we're born again. But I have proof of the guarantee. I have something you don't have. I have the confirmation of the presence and I would answer that question in loving and gentleness but I would say to them that's the difference between you and I if they say to me that's weird could we just bow our heads before the Lord and I don't believe you have to come to the altar to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit But there's something powerful about laying on of hands, something supernatural. There's something, it has supernatural results when brothers and sisters lay hands and pray, pray over people. If you would like to be filled with the Spirit or you have any need whatsoever, I'm going to invite you to come. And one of these ministers at the altar here just say I, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost I want to be filled with the Spirit and they're, they're, going to, they're going to pray over you they're going to lay hands on you or you can communicate whatever need you might have but we're going to sing this last song and then Scott will dismiss us There's no 